Uh, so as you see, I'm not up here alone. Right? I have uh, three uh, volunteers. <laughs> you know how Bill's volunteer <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right. I'm a selected volunteer. <laughs> Uh, so Terry, Dave, and, and Artie were kind enough to agree to share this. And, and I, we did this session last year, and, and it was kind of an experiment, but we decided to repeat it. Right? And part of it is that um, we all have stories to tell. And I always find it fascinating, because even when I approach these guys, they're like, well, um, I don't know what I would really share. Like, well, I do. Right? Because knowing them, I know that they do have th things to go on. So it'll be a little bit different. We're not necessarily going to be talking about, well, this is how you go about setting up your network. Uh, this is how you go about you know, tuning your system. But I want them to share more about you know, their, their career whistling. And I hear it again. I'm taking it. Uh, it goes back to the end of the class. Um, of what helped them along their career? What, what different things came up and, and so forth? So I did talk a little bit with them ahead of time. Um, I told them I wanted to get some background, and then I'd give them the questions that I might ask. I lied. I didn't give them the questions I'm going to ask. But they're, they're not scared. Look at them. They're like, bring it on. Um, so with that, uh, let me just go down the row here, and why don't you just introduce yourselves a little bit briefly about uh, you know, who you are, why are you here. My name is Terry Dunlap. I currently work for Visa, uh, supporting VM and a, and a very large uh, we'll call it a cloud environment running TPF, along with some Linuxes. Uh, I worked for IBM for 20 years the first time. I uh, started out in, the, in, the, in the, actually writing code for IBM for the PIM system, if anybody remembers PIMS, as the inventory control system for the service division. And then moved, migrated from there into being an SE in a marketing office, and was an SE and then a, a a uh, billable resource out of, the, out of the marketing office for about 20 years. Then I went to work as an IMS system programmer uh, for uh, AT&T, because when I was in the SE, I supported ZOS, VM, and VSE, uh, along with doing RACF and DB2 and CSCS and a few other things. You were a jack of all trades if you were an SE, and as well as hardware configuration. And then I went from there to AT&T, and then IBM, or AT&T outsourced to, I back to IBM. So I went back to work for IBM and jumped ship from the AT&T support and went over and worked in lab services uh, doing VM and Linux installs for a couple years. And then uh, went to work for uh, TD Ameritrade, ran their systems for five years running VM and Linux. And then uh, went from there to Visa. Cool. So did you get all that? Because that's on the, the yeah, task. Right. Right. You're going to plot down. You're going to draw over that. Those are 20, 20, 20 years. <laughs> well, and, and I guess when I went to work for IBM, I thought I'd never have to change careers again, or change companies again. You know, and it shows you how the industry has changed. Because by back then, the IBM was a cradle to grave company, as many people right. here remember. I guess so, the summary is. Being in mainframe business, the more the most employable business as a as a mainframe program. So, <laughs> learned a lot of things along the way. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Terry. Dave, a little bit about you know who are you and, and why are you here? Dave's not here, man. Dave's not here. <laughs> 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 uh, well, uh, my name is Dave Jones. Uh, I live in uh, Houston, uh, Texas. Uh, I uh, came out of uh, Texas A&M University in 1975 with degrees in geophysics, and I went to work for Chevron. And uh, back then, in the early to mid 70s, computers were just getting fast enough and cheap enough to begin doing seismic data processing in the search for oil and gas. <coughs> And Texas A&M had a program that specialized in that. And uh, A&M had a 360 model 65 running in the back then? Yeah. And uh, to earn my keep uh, there in grad school, uh, I needed to learn how to write Fortran. And my professor just pointed me to the bookstore and said, goodbye, book on Fortran 4. And I did. And I still have. 
and uh, you know, learned to write forte, and then uh, you know, as part of my education, uh, writing seismic data processing algorithms in Fortran on an 026 key punch. If, uh, in fact, I still have some programs on, on, on uh, punch cards back at the house somewhere. Uh, and the oil companies uh, then were very interested in that sort of thing, so I took a job with Chevron. Chevron had a 370 165. Well, actually, they had two of them. One was running MDS, and the other was running another system called TSS, which was kind of a competitor. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Time sharing system. Uh, and that's where I really got interested in computing, number one, and number two, IBM. Uh, <clears throat> because you know, these mainframes cost zillions of dollars, and you know, Chevron was a big, big, big customer. We had our own internal IBM SEs. They had their own office. They showed up every day just like we did. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to go sit and talk with them, because they were just down the hall, you know, they'd be sitting there talking to you, and you know, they'd show you things. Uh, you know, well, this is, uh, well, this is, uh, you know, this is a patch we just got for, uh, on the operating system, we're going to go try to apply it over the weekend. And back then, you know, you could just walk into the machine room and uh, uh, sit, uh, well, you couldn't sit at the console, but you'd certainly sit there and look at it and uh, watch the operators doing what they did. And uh, that just got me even more and more interested. So uh, after spending 20 years in the oil and gas business, uh, and getting laid off four times, none of which were my fault. Uh, I decided I was going to switch and just become into the uh, uh, mainframe world. Because by then I was completely convinced that IBM knew what they were doing and that uh, you know, the products were better than anything else. And if nothing else, they were certainly better documented. Chevron had a 165, as I've said. But the bookshelf with all the manuals was at least 40 feet long. And one of the SE said one of the IBM design rules for building mainframes was the documentation had to equal the weight of the mainframe. <laughs> <laughs> and when it had that, they could ship it. Okay. Because everything, I mean, it was documented out the wazoo. You wanted to know the control blocks, and it really was. You know, you wanted, uh, uh, well, it was just extremely well documented. And uh, for somebody like myself, I'm self-taught. I never went to computer science class. Uh, you know, like I said, I, was, I had to learn Fortran. Well, here's the book. Okay. Uh, and then Chevron had some internal training courses uh, on, on computer architecture and uh, doing things. We had some IBM array processors. Well, the first one was called the 2828. The second one was called the 3828. They were built boxes to do uh, vector processing. And uh, after that, like I said, after that, I decided I would just go. Well, my last job in the oil and gas business was with a small company that brought in a small mainframe because they were beginning to uh, grow. And the Intel boxes they had, this was in the mid-1985, 1986. They brought in a 9575 air-cooled CMOS processor. And they wanted something to run on it. And I said, you guys got a little, there's this thing out there called VM. And it looks very, very friendly, okay? No JCL, uh, no ISPF, uh, that sort of thing. And it looks like something we can get our hands around ourselves, be self-taught. And they said, okay. So we brought it in, we brought in uh, a VM SP Release 5. And that was my first introduction to VM. And it's also my first introduction to a number of people in this room. Uh, which, by the way, I have to say, I really appreciate uh, y'all taking the time to educate me because, you know, like I said, I don't have an you know, uh, education background in this. It's all because people like yourselves took time and pity 
of four stupid Texans <laughs> who didn't quite grasp XN just yet. And that, you know, that was a big part of what I, what I did. Now I'm, I'm basically a freelance consultant uh, uh, working through a company called uh, Liberation Technology. Uh, we do contracting work. If you have a short term project, you know, we can do it. Uh, if you have some longer term support needs, we can do it remotely, you know, that sort of thing. So that's what I do. Uh, Thank you. I'm Art Peacock. Uh, I also started out with a 026 key punch. Uh, prior to that, we did all our work on Omar cards mm. with number two pencils. Mm. So you learned the, uh, the Holland code very well. Um, I started out as a student in City College in the engineering department. Um, they gave me a, a Fortran class, and uh, after the Fortran class, I immediately switched majors to computer science because I found out if you got paid to do something this easy, why should I go through all the horrors of learning to be a mechanical engineer? I'll do computer science instead. Much, much easier. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I did. Um, so our, the, the, the Trinity system is 23 schools uh, around the New York metropolitan area, and they have a central facility. It used to be located in Midtown Manhattan at 57th Street. And at that central facility, they had more than one key punch. Uh, the schools had one, one or two key punches in the schools, so there was always a long line to get to the key punches. But the central facility had, had a large number of key punches. So I would go down to the central facility to do my homework. And I would you know, walk right up to a key punch, punch my deck, put it in, get my homework done, and leave. But I, I wound up spending so much time at the uh, central facility <coughs> that, that the director hired me because I was there all the time, and I was answering questions of everyone else there uh, struggling with JCL. And back then, it was easy to be a, a JCL expert because there was only like three or four different types of, of JCL. You know, job, GD, and this and that, and that's it. Um, so it was a simple job, so you know, it easy, to, easy for me to get hired. Um, so they hired me, and 38 years later, I, I haven't left yet. <laughs> so I, I also do some freelance work. Um, I, uh, I help various government uh, and uh, local uh, government agencies um, do small odd, odd projects. But throughout my career, I've, I started my VM career on VM 370 release by basic systems extensions program product. I think that's one of the longest uh, names of a, a VM system. Uh, that, that ever created. Um, I've been on every release since then. I've been on most of the ESPs uh, since SP1. I've um, done a bunch of research projects with various places like Endicott, uh, Bohm, DJ Watson. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to contribute some code to uh, VM and MBS, uh, Rec Sockets. So that's, that's shipped with the product now. So. That's, that's, that's kind of a nice honor that, that you know, my, nice. my code is, is in there. And uh, I've just been doing this for a very long time, and it's just, you know, it's one of those easy jobs that, that, that fit my temperament. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, Artie. I, I just think it's neat because there's this um, variety here in terms of, of Artie who, who's at the same spot like forever and then some, right? And, and Terry, you've moved around a lot. Dave, a, a complete career change in there. Uh, also, Dave kind of gave away a secret there, right? So you thought we were making machines smaller. It's because we, we don't want to do as much documentation now. Yes. <laughs> and so it, it works out. Right? Um, so a few, a few other things I want to go back to. Um, one for Dave. You told me something about, I believe it was Peru and a children's microscope um, and tapes. Oh, oh. Well, in the well, obviously in the geophysics business, in the oil and gas business, oil and gas is never found just outside, well, you know, London or New York or some place where you can get a good hotel room. <laughs> it's always found out in the middle of you know, bum, what you would call it, West Texas or the jungles of Peru or Indonesia, what? You know, back then, the, the data was recorded by. The, that the geophysical crews out in the field on nine-track tape, IBM tape. 
and, and uh, a lot of the well, these these environments are pretty uh, you know, the opposite of non-clean room. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you the snake story here in just a minute. Uh, so we would get in tapes, data tapes from you know wherever, uh, and the heads would be misaligned from in the heel from the in the field. So we had IBM engineers there that could change the head alignments on our 24, what were they, 2460s, what were the tech drives in? Reel to reel, non track. You were there, I was. 6250s. Huh? 6250s? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you would, uh, you would take the uh, non track drive, you put it in there, the window would close, it would auto thread itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. We, uh, to get in, uh, we had the IBM engineers there to align the heads you know, by hand, by a little, a little uh, screwdriver, uh, to get the uh, our, our alignment on our drives to match the misalignment on the drives in the field that had uh, recorded the data. And back then, we were using 60, uh, a 1600 BPI. Okay. One of our engineers took a little microscope made a little gizmo that had round iron filings in it. So he could put that thing over the tape, he could stretch the tape out, put the thing over it, and see the bands of the, of the uh, 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 magnetic recordings. So we could try to figure out which way is, uh, you know, how do we need to do. Sometimes we could actually read the data. All geophysical tapes are recorded in EBCD to this day because it's an industry standard now. So EBCDIC is not going away anytime soon. Uh, but yeah. Uh, the snake story is one of my buddies from AM had gone to the field because he liked to be out in the field. And he was in Peru in the jungle and they were recording away in the uh, seismic truck, which is uh, well, it's a truck that's got a little enclosure on it with the recording gear and all that. And uh, he's in there looking at the uh, data as it's coming in. And he goes outside, and he steps outside to go, uh, to go outside, you know, down a little ladder. And there's this boa constrictor on a stick propped up against the side of the truck. It scared him to death. The natives, where they were working, thinks that seeing a boa constrictor is a sign of good luck. So they, they, they cut the limbs that was on off of the tree, and they brought it back to show the Americans that they were going to have good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's my stuff. I like that. Um, Artie, you, you talked a little bit about um, funny money and some things that were influenced by that in terms of tape mounts and stuff. Well, that was the, uh, the, the JCL experience. Um, I, I mentioned that I was um, hired as a uh, JCL expert. and. Again, it wasn't hard to be a JCL expert, but what I knew was a lot of things that uh, a lot of my compatriots didn't know. We would charge funny money whenever we, we ran jobs because they needed to do some kind of fake chargeback to allocate their resources. And we'd all get a little bit of funny money, and then you know you would get charged until it goes to zero, then you would beg for more funny money, and you'd continue. Well, tape mounts cost a dollar. Every time you did a tape mount, it cost a dollar. So if you had, you know, $10 worth of funny money and you had your JCL was um, not optimized for keeping the tape across the steps, then one job, you could go your, your $10. So, you know, I, that happened to a lot of people and I, I just read up on the JCL. I said, well, no, you just use the use, uh, lead. Your comma, comma, comma key. Well, right, right. Yeah. There's all kinds of crazy yeah. things you can do. So I learned that one parameter on a D card, and boom, I was the expert because <laughs> I, I could run my, my job cost me two bucks. Someone else runs their job cost them twenty. So same job, but <laughs> I kept my tape for all the uh, all the job steps. So that that gave me that helped build up my reputation as as being the JCL guy. And it was just. You know, out of necessity to to mm. take from money out of funny money. But you knew something that others did, and it was something that was valuable. Yeah. Right. And so you ended up being the man. And, and they hired me. <laughs> 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 cool. So JCL is good for something. 
He got you. Yeah, yeah. And that was back in the day when the schools, the, there was actually classes that taught JCL. Yeah. I mean, there was actually an actual course that taught JCL in City College. Really? Yeah. Now we don't even teach COBOL. We don't, I don't think we even teach C. I mean, I, I don't know what they're teaching these days, but it's, it's not me thing related at all. Okay. So. All right. Um, so, Terry, t tell me a little bit about, if you recall, so you were in school, and your professor kind of got you connected to some stuff at IBM. Um, and that's how some things started for you? Well, I, I'm originally a business major. Um, and in the business school I was at, at Indiana University, you had to take a concentration, like accounting or finance or something as part of your business degree. Well, they were starting up a, they had a program there that was called quantitative business analysis which was basically using a computer to solve business problems, which had to do with you know, inventory control and, and things like that. Well, it turns out that IBM had a facility about uh, an hour from there, which was a repurposed card printing plant. When cards went away, this would have been in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, when cards went away, they'd repurposed that as an inventory control site and, it, and that was when IBM had busted up the company into three divisions <coughs> in case they got caught in the, um, yeah, the, the monopoly and get, get busted up like the antitrust like AT&T did. So that was actually originally the OP inventory, national inventory control site. So by this point, the antitrust was over. They were starting to bring the company back together but there was a bunch of inventory control stuff, but we, there was a group resident there that was doing the programming for the inventory control systems. And it turns out the, the manager there had a friend or somehow connected with my, one of my professors at IU who used to be an IBMer. And so instead of going through a formal process to, to hire interns, he went to the professor and said, recommend some of your best students and to, to, to come and to interview for a position as an intern working in inventory control. It was kind of like a decision a sciences type department, research department. And so he, he set me up and I went and talked to them and, and uh, they hired me. So I, I worked there my, the, so, so, well, the spring of my senior year. I took the semester off and went to work for them and then they asked me to stay on for the summer and the, the person I had been working directly under ended up transferring and I, so I took over their responsibilities, rearranged my schedule so I could finish four days a week in the fall and come down and work one day a week and then they hired me before I even graduated. So, when you have a Hoosier, an Aggie and I don't know what Cooney's mascot is. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, they're looking for a mascot. That's all right. Nobody, nobody knows what Hoosier is. Nobody knows what Hoosier is either. Right. Well, that explains why they've never won an NCAA football championship. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they do. Um, they do. Tell me a little bit more about, I, I thought it was interesting, this relationship you end up having with the CE that were there, and just sharing the information and the stuff that would go on. Um, when you had that opportunity, because you are a self-learner kind of stuff, and so having this kind of resource there uh, before Google or Wikipedia. Well, uh, yeah, that was, a, I, I certainly think it was very beneficial to me. Uh, the two gentlemen there, and unfortunately I've long since forgotten their names, uh, they were just the nicest down-to-earth people. And, you know, you could go in and uh, you know, talk to them about anything, or they tell us, or uh, they tell me, you know, something they rumors that they heard well I was going to be coming out with, you know, some new uh, new model of this, maybe uh, you know, maybe maybe virtual memory will be here. Or maybe we'll announce a one sixty five and then immediately announce a virtual memory version of it to piss off the Chevron executives. <laughs> <laughs> which they did. Uh, uh, but, uh, they also had stuff that looked like to me to be magic, because this is it, not the, the 1975, 76, 77. The CEs had a little Motorola box, about yay by yay by yay. It had a little keyboard on it that could communicate 
uh, through radio some way to get parts. They could type in error messages from the console into this thing and it would tell them where to go find the meaning of it. Now this is 1976. That's magic. Okay? Uh, wow. Anybody can have to do that. Probably better stick around with these guys. So, and you know, if there was something about uh, MBS that I didn't quite understand, uh, you know, why were why were we going to do it this way in the Fortran code instead of doing it this other way? Uh, you know, they could. Well, we're going to do it this way because the architecture of that machine says that you know, certain things need to be double word aligned. That makes it go faster. The one thing you do in the oil and gas business is you go faster. So that's, that's what we do. And all this training, by the way, was free. Red books, I'd never seen a red book. Oh, oh yeah, here you go. Well, how much are you? No, no, free. And this was back then before you could download them. They actually ordered them from what, Gibson. Remember they came from Mechanics Square? Yeah. Uh, you know, so, well, here, you know, this is a red book written by so and so and so and so. We'll yeah, help you out there. VSAN. We were looking into using VSAN as an access method to get the seismic data, which are just long vectors of binary floating point numbers, uh, you know, in and out. Because a lot of times we have to, we have to get each of, one of, uh, each of these vectors in a certain order. And they, we were looking into using VSAM to do that. I have to use that book. I have to. This is a totally unplanned question now that it, it pops in my mind. So, so we'll start with Artie and we'll come back to me. Um, what kind of collectibles do you have? in your home or your office oh up over the years that, that pop out. Like when I said that, I'm sure something popped into each of your minds. <laughs> I, I've got I've got an off switch, red type of off switch from a V70 something or other, but it has a hard click. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were decommissioning it, and I asked the SC if I could have the switch, because I, I love that <laughs> solid click. And I had that on my desk at home my home office. In my work office, I have a 3330 disc bag on the floor under my desk. And that is my foot desk. <laughs> <laughs> I have that 3330 under my desk for all these years. So it's a wonderful foot vest. On the side of my uh, wall, I have a core plane from a 36050 LCS. You can actually see the little cores with the wires running through. And when we ever have young kids come in and they see they see the core plane, they say, why do you have a, a sieve in your office? And I explain to them it's it's core memory, and I explain the meaning of the word bit flip. Because the bits would actually flip from one side of a pair of wires to the other side of the pair of wires. And on a 360-50 LCS, does anyone here remember LCS storage? No one? You could run a per LCS storage was a external storage for uh, a 360, 370, I forgot. Um, but it was a, an extra box. Okay. And while you're running programs, if you put your ear next to the box, you could hear this, this kind of rain sound, the okay. whooshing rain sound. Oh, okay. yeah. And that was your program and the bits making the sound as they could. Right. We had, we had Cambridge memory on our <coughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brand, brand X. Yeah. But I, I have a core play, actual okay. core play from, from, the, from that computer on my, on my wall. Very nice. Those, those are my, my uh, only real collectibles. I don't right. collect too much other junk. All right. <laughs> Some of it's very handy. All right, now if we need one of those, I know where to go. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Dave? Do you have anything? The uh, one great conflict I have with my wife <laughs> is the 50 feet of bus and tag cable oh, God. I in the garage. <laughs> oh, oh. 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 Great, great, great cable? Great. Yeah. Great. Oh. Great. Oh. Great. Oh. Great. Oh. 
Well, you just tell her it's too heavy to move. I've got the blue uh, 90 bus cat here, but not, 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 not the full size. But you know, I hear in, in some countries, that's a sign of good luck, is to have a bus of cat hanging around. Some say steaks, some say steaks. Some say steaks, probably wait about it. You know, I used to have a lot of stuff. When I moved to Denver, uh -huh. I, I, about three years ago, my, I, I, we made the effort to purge a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I had one wall of the garage that was just bookshelves. And I had, because I supported VM, VSC, and MBS before the, C, the CDs came out. And so I had, a set, I had two bookshelves for MBS and one for VM and one for VSE in my garage. And then I also had another set of, of the critical manuals that I carried around with me. Um, I had a old DeSusu pickup truck and I had a uh, car top carrier that I that set the back of the bed because I didn't have a cargo cover over it. And I had it full of box of manuals because when you ordered a, a new version of the, of the operating system for a customer, you always ordered manuals. And if they said they didn't want them, then that was that was free freebies for us to have manuals so we could go from place to place. You never knew what manuals they'd have, so you carried them with you. Well, I had this whole thing full. It must have weighed three, 400 pounds of manuals. And I came out one morning and the car top carrier was gone. It was parked out on the street. Best I can figure, somebody thought it was full of tools. They were gonna make a whole bunch of money. They picked the whole car top carrier up and, and stole it. <laughs> and I always wanted to see the look on their face when they opened that up, and it was full IBM manual, but I never found out what happened to it. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a gun rack, it's like a manual rack. Yeah. Maybe it's not a full gun. So, so um, Dave mentioning the CEs and parts and ordering parts and stuff reminded me of. of Terry, you had been involved with, I think it was the 3090 family, when, when they were trying to figure out, um, when that was launching, parts and how many parts and stuff would be needed. Am I remember that correctly? Or help well, me out with that. Long story short, we actually, my department actually delayed the shipment of the 390 because the we would not agree to the amount of inventory money they would give us for parts. And the story behind that is that the marketing or, or the plant would say, well, this is how much we think you need to have the, the part, the, the, to keep card on board, which is the cards that were right there on site hours away when the 3090 was coming out. And so being in this operations research group, we were asked to try to figure out if that was the right amount of money or not. Well, we had developed these algorithms on, on, on figuring out how to determine where the stocking location should be for all the parts in the, in the company for different machine types. And so we took the install base for the 3080s and we ran a random number generator at it to, uh, to, to determine where the machines might end up in a scattergram across the country. And this is in 1985, 86. So you can imagine, I mean, we didn't have big, you know, this was all numerical. There wasn't any graphics at all. But we, so we figured out where all these were gonna be and how, where we'd have to place parts to support that over the next year or two um, and basically determined that they had under, under budgeted us by 50% uh, on how much money we'd need to keep the inventory that was needed. And so we, we kind of stalled the uh, shipment of the 390 until they agreed to give us enough par uh, money to, to, to stock the inventory they wanted in order to have the two hour one hour and on-site cards. Right. So I'll deal with the whole meantime between failure and what was going on there and, and some parts were a little bit bigger back then. And, and yeah. yeah. So that, that's kind of neat. Well, it's stuff that I never thought about. I don't know, parts just show up. What the heck? <laughs> well, the whole PIP system, there was, let's say there was, there was uh, three national stocking locations for different inventory of parts. There were 12 different regional parts centers and then there was over, well, between 10 and 20,000 uh, inventory locations out in the field. And there was 250,000 stock keeping units or part numbers. So that's what, 
what the, the programs that we wrote were managing at that time. Cool. All right, so uh, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about code. So is there anybody here on the panel that has modified <coughs> one of the DMK modules? All right, so let's hear some stories, boys. Right. Terry, do you want to go first or Artie? I, I know, I I know Artie. Them, so. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, let me think about was there one dealing with multiple processes? There was one dealing with um, um, virtual virtual equals real recovery. Recovery, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, virtual equals real is when the NBS guest assumed uh, control of the entire complex. Uh, in the event of a VM failure and you're running an NBS guest, uh, to preserve the NBS guest, there was this feature that you could run in VM where the NBS guest would assume control of the whole processor. Um, but I found a, a case where on a, on a multiprocessor where it didn't work. If it was on the wrong side of the multiprocessor, it would put, it would put, um, it, one of the processors was sleeping and it needed to be woken up. It was basically missing a signal processor was missing one instruction to make the whole thing work in this weird configuration. And I was telling telling the Bill, you know, one of the reasons why I got into VM in the first place, I was learning assembler in, in college, and we only were, uh, taught the, uh, the, the non-privileged instructions. But there was a whole set of supervised instructions that, you know, hey, you know, I want to learn those too. Well, you can't run those on MDS. I go, well, why not? <laughs> and you know they go into this whole thing. Well, you need to be in supervisor state. Well, well I want to be in supervisor state. <laughs> so that's that's how I found VM. And you know in VM, you know you start writing instructions, start using uh, Start.io, load PFW, all those other cool instructions, but never a signal process. <laughs> so well, not until recently. <laughs> um, not back then, at least. But uh, this particular DMK module, I, I added that one instruction, and it made equals Y recovery work. But um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, how many people here have, have coded uh, a sync P? Really? I would expect Neil to raise his hand, but uh, there you go. Yeah, so some people collect baseball cards, already collects you know, op codes. And <laughs> no, it's, you know, when you're running a, a language, you like to learn the whole language. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's one a little bit of a tangent, but um, you know, riding down here in the car with Gonzalo, um, who English is not his first language, I'm just was still amazed at, at how much he can speak. And so I started thinking about, you know, how many words do you really need to know in a language to be considered fluent? And so how many different instructions in an architecture do you need to know to be considered fluent? Uh, yeah. Well, and, and I, I was very yeah. passionate about assembly, right. right? So if you want to try, try everything. Right. So I, I, and I did. <laughs> I'm glad you did. So <laughs> Terry, you had talked about also. Uh... Well, most of I, I never really, I never modified the mo the uh, the modules, the DMK module on okay. the system that was in storage or in on on disk. I. We, we might have tweaked the ones that were actually running at the time. Uh, you remember PSRs? Well, then they did away with the PSRs, and then they had something called the Ops SEs. Well, I was ne wasn't old enough to be a PSR, but I ended up being an Ops SE. And so sometimes people, customers' computers would get sick, and they wouldn't want to bring them down, and so we would look at the, the, the actual assembler code and determine what the difference was between the, there might be a you know a few bit a few bytes difference in the instructions that we would actually go in and, and store the changed instruction on a running system so they wouldn't have to bring it down. And then you know every once in a while you you'd flip a bit on a on a uh, on on the VMDBK block so on a on a. Uh, user ID that was that wouldn't come down, so you could get it, so you could get it to come down, so they wouldn't have to, to crash the whole system. So yeah, you, you twiddled some bits on running systems and prayed that they wouldn't crash. That was the first way to shut down the idea. Yeah, the law. Of course, they didn't want to do that. 
Yeah. So let me remind people they are trained professionals. <laughs> do not do this at home. <laughs> so, so Terry, with, with that, you talked about you, you went to dump school. Is that correct? Or well, what, what we yeah. somewhat called dump school back, back then in the day of learning how to really do from information, and that it was a big thing for the, the folks helping the people in the field. Well, I went. I was. I went, well, I went through the full SE training. Well, SE training was a year's worth of education. So the first three classes you went to, you went with the marketing people. And then the fourth is when you actually got real technical skills. So I had to learn how to do the IBM sales call. There was a very set formula you had to go through. And I don't know how much you're interested in, in marketing or not, but at the time, why, one, of the, you know, the, one of the reasons marketing was so good for IBM was this training we did. You had to go through about eight weeks worth of online education, or reading, I'm sorry, with tests as you went along, and you had to score 90% on the tests, and you had to finish all the education before you went to class. And then when you got to class, they gave you a test when you got to class, and then they'd give you some lectures, you'd go to lunch, you'd come back and see who was left. Because if you didn't pass the class, you couldn't stay for this th two or three weeks class. And, the, and there was four of these different classes you had to go through. And the fourth one was for just for the SEs. It was a four-week class. These were done in Dallas. And, and you had, uh, they basically gave you tapes and you had a, a, a vanilla machine and manuals. And you would have lab, you had lectures in the morning and you, and you had a two-hour lab window every other day. And by the end of class, you had to have, you had to create a, a a VM, you had to create it, you had to have it installed, and you had to have MBS installed, you had to customize a 360, you had to set up your VTAM so they communicate back and forth, you had to set up CICS, and you had to have all that so that you could submit a job from the, from the 360, it would go over to the MBS and run, come back out through RSCS to the VM machine, and, and, pr and create the printout, and that was your final that all that worked. So the education was, was pretty crazy. But then after that, then I went to dump school. So you would go and just spend time, they would actually spend time teaching you, you the control blocks. And then they'd hand you dumps and say, figure out what happened. So I did that for CICS and BSC. And so it was an interesting way to learn how to, to, to do those kinds of things. Now I work with the guy who was doing a lot of that too. His name's Lee Stewart. He tells a story about going to some place in, I don't know, some secure site someplace back in the 70s to pick up a dump right after he got hired. And it was, it was they had to go through the dump with an a, uh, X-Acto knife and take out the, the pieces that were secure. And it looked like a piece of Swiss cheese when he got it because it, they had to take all the data portions out and just leave the, the instruction sets. But imagine doing that on a dump, on a paper dump, before you could, it was this thick before you could get it. Just amazing. The things that got done back in those days and we still managed to get anything done. So is there any truth that the, the show Survivor is based off of this original school? Well, it was, it was an interesting school. It was, it was certainly a, a challenge, especially when you had these, it, I mean, you, you learned how to plan out, you know, today, we, you know, we're used to, you know, you've got a two-hour or four-hour maintenance window or something. You, you learned that you planned out what you were going to do, and you had a very specific plan because you only had those two hours maybe twice or three times a week, and you had to get all that done in, in that time frame. So it was great training, but it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was pretty intense. Cool. All right. Let's, uh, I mentioned languages earlier. Let's talk a little bit about languages. So, um, Dave, what, what did you ask me to ask Reed Mullen? I want the latest PL1 compiler under CMS. <laughs> I wanted it for 40 years. And it. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about your uh, introduction to PL1 and your love. Well, this goes back to when I was in grad school at, at a &E, and you know, Fortran I thought was, you know, okay, this, this is pretty good stuff. Uh, but then IBM was having a big push back then 
for this new language that they come out with, with the old one. And uh, they, uh, IBM would send uh, an IBMer to talk about to just about anybody that said, hey, yeah, we want to learn about it. And somebody at AMM had an IBMer come up to give an introduction to it, and I went. And I thought, ooh, well, that looks pretty damn interesting. It kind of does all the hard parts for me and it leaves the easy parts for me to do. Okay, you want to write a string on the printer, you know, uh, on the line printer, well, you know, okay, it's just declare x, uh, you know, care percent uh, parentheses 250 varying, if you want it varying length. You know, Fortran, that was a giant uh, big mess. And, 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 of course, you know, back then all the software was free. So, oh, yeah, sure, we'll take it. And when I was doing uh, my thesis, uh, I decided to do it in PL1. And I really, really, really liked it. And, uh, in fact, it's still my favorite compiled language. And practically everything that's come since has been, in my opinion, a step backward. <laughs> but, you know, that's just me. I, I could write this thing, uh, you know, like uh, on storage. You know, if we ran out of storage, okay, here's a begin block, and I can take control of that. Okay. Well, that was the compilers that were available back then. And the only compiler IBM supports today under CMS is the very old OS and VM optimizer compiler. And it's, it's okay. It's, it works. It works good. Uh, but the one that they have under ZOS now is very much uh, evolved. Has a lot of new features in it, uh, a lot of new support for new paragraph, uh, you know, the paradigms of program, uh, that sort of thing. Has support for packages, and I would dearly love to see that available. Since I was told at one time that the developers of that use CMS as the development environment, <laughs> so it's actually running, yeah. uh, but they just don't want to support it. Well, Reed said he's going to look into it, but yeah, yeah, sure. no problem. <laughs> he's always <laughs> so bad. He's going to retire. So, uh, Artie, how about you? What, do you have a language of choice? Uh, it, it's always a simple Always That's, a simple I, I mean, it, it depends on the task. I. I these days, I tend to do a lot of um, firefighting and fixing broken things. So I, I normally fix things in the language they've broken. Okay. So okay. you, you might be collecting a bunch of languages in your back pocket so that you right. can fix them. But my, my go-to language is pretty much assembler. Um, I, I, I can code in very, very many other languages, but what comes off these fingertips is That's your heart, heart language. Too. Yeah. And if it's something quick and dirty, it's always Rex. So. Mary, how about you? Well, I started out writing PL1, and so that's probably my favorite. And when I joined IBM and wrote, wrote code in PL1 for several years, so probably PL1. Okay. Cool. Um, so we're going to the lightning round now. Um, <laughs> I asked, I think you guys, each of these questions when we, we talked previously, but if, if you look back over the course of the end, what are some innovations that stick out to you? Um, or, or things that were of value uh, over the years? Um, does anybody remember what, what you, I think I have what some of you looked at. So. Uh, I, I always point to, to VEX, I point to the straight file system, is that those, you know, X edit. Big innovations of, at, at the time right. that uh, you know, we take for granted these days, but at the time there was, there was nothing like them. It right? was very revolutionary at the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember you, you had talked about when you first saw Rex, the feeling that overcame. Oh, and I was I was struggling with Exec Two as as most of you remember Exec Two struggled with trying to do anything useful in Exec Two. You'd be, be very fancy, you'd be very proud of yourself, but then you'd feel dirty afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, that's, that's kind of true, right? Um, but with Rex, I was introduced to Rex because I was on a, uh, a, a, a joint study with probably um, Yorktown or something. Mm -hmm. and they gave me a, a RDX module mm -hmm. uh, for CMS2. And it wasn't available in CMS2, but it said Rex I. 
get the uh, you get you get to load the interpreter, and then you can start coding Rex. And uh, that, that was just fantastic. The whole world opened up because you know all of a sudden you didn't have to do exec two anymore. You could code a, a rational language and you could get things done. So that was that was fantastic. It's like the end of Wizard of Oz where things come mm -hmm. up in color. Color. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing with, with I told you the story about SFS. Um, it wasn't we were running HPO five at the time, and SFS came out in SP6, and it wasn't available in HBO5. So I, I made it available in HBO5. <laughs> I, 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 I uh, refitted the, uh, the DMK modules at the time uh, from SP6 to, to HBO5. And I had, SP, I had SFS running under, under HBO5, because I, I wanted it. Sure. You don't own it until you void the warranty. Well, we never ran it. We it wasn't never, the point. Yeah, we never ran HBO 6. We, uh, we went from HBO 5 to the migration aid thing. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. No, it's the SP. So how about you, Terry? Were there things that, that stood out to you? Well, I was being an SE at the time, so I didn't have a lot of time to do coding. But I think VM was really the, the, the precursor to the open community that you see today, the open development community. Since they, since they shipped the source, to the, the, the out, then then people like you in this room would would go in there and start messing around with things, and also start creating things that you needed or wanted. You well, know, we'd I, fix things that were broken and give, yeah. IBM, would give IBM the fix. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I mean, you know, and, and they really kept IBM in the in the game mainframe game in some areas, like the TCP/IP. I mean, that was all written on VM by somebody who just wanted to be able to do it. And then they eventually got ported it to MBS because they needed something to get it on the platform. And then, you know, how many years later they finally rewrote it? But you know, it, it was a it was a development platform that that allowed a, a lot of innovation on the mainframe for new things that came on that IBM hadn't put anything into yet. You forgot to mention which language it was written. <laughs> Pascal. 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 That's true. <laughs> Dave, how about you? You had mentioned a few things that, that, that jumped out. Well, um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, well, Rex, obviously. But since I came to VM so late in the game compared to these two gentlemen, you know, I always have Rex because my first one was VMSP release five, and, uh, and then the very next release that next year was we got SFS, which oh, Rex is really good. But you know, you can't forget CMS pipeline. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or exit it. I mentioned yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Um, well, we, we talked about community, and, and Dave, I know um, you're a knight of VM. And, and if I recall, your title is Sir Dave the Generous, um, which I think is fitting because you are one of those people that whenever somebody has a problem, you, you know, you, you're on the mailing list quite a bit. Up and out in different things, so so I appreciate that. My um, answer is always RTFL. <laughs> I read the book, so you might as well read the book here. Um, talk, just talk briefly about um, how the community welcomed you and, and how you can talk a little bit about paying back. Uh, well, it all goes it all goes back to the fact that I entered this kind of through the back door. I'm self taught I got interested in this because I worked at an oil company that had an IBM mainframe, and some SEs there were, you know, willing to defend me and show me how things work, which led to more interest and that sort of uh, that sort of thing. And then when I was working in my last job in the oil and gas industry with Z, with VM, the MSP, I found this thing called VM Share, and. Uh, out there and ask questions. And I was back then, I was going fairly regularly to share. Uh, and I started to meet people, a number of which are in this room right now, and they were all very welcoming. Oh, hi. Yeah, oh, you're interested in being home. Yeah, come over here to this table. You know, you've got to meet all these people. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, follow the bear. Got it. Uh, and it was that attitude compared to some, uh, some professional uh, instances I've had where that was not the attitude. Uh, 
this one, well, there was a time in my career when, when I really tried to get into Unix, okay? And I was flatly told by some people that there's clearly no room in, in Unix for people like yourself. <laughs> but that was not the attitude that we were in. You know, they didn't care what I knew. They didn't care what I didn't know. But the very fact I was interested and uh, willing to do the work, you know, and to, to, you know, try these things out, and that they were willing to spend their time and energy helping me, that made a big impression on me. Cool. Well, I'm glad you're part of the community. So, Sir Artie the Toolman. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I look back at that and, you know, considering some of the accomplishments of other people, especially in this room, I, 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 I feel very um, grateful that that was bestowed upon me, but, you know, for what really good reason. I, I don't think I produced that, that many tools, but I guess the tools that I did produce um, were used very, very frequently. Uh, I once wrote something called IUCD Trap very many years ago. It was a way of letting a, an exec trap IUCD messages. And you know, the, the kids, the students were using it a lot. And Rice University uh, once sent me statistics for usage of the module during the month. And they said it was it was it was invoked over a million times in one month at Rice University during whatever. And that impressed me that something that I wrote was used a million times by a bunch of crazy students at a, at a university down south. But I mean, at, at other tools that I still use today, um, but I think what, you know, I'm just very honored that they, they or that people thought that I, I created a massive amount of tools, but I think it's more the, the quality of the few, few ones that I, I did disseminate. Definitely high quality. It wasn't like we did a million times on control delete. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, and, and so, Terry, you've been in a lot of different worlds, in the IMS, MES, this and that, and so forth. Um, no pressure, but in terms of the communities, the ZBM, and so forth, compared to some of those others, or, or just, you know, what's been your experience with, with, with the world? Well, I mean, this. I, I worked in big shops, I worked in small shops, and I tended to like the smaller shops better. You know, you, you tended to have less specialties. Um, a lot of it came down to w w a management, general management in, in most of the Midwest shops where I worked were, were pretty down to earth. You know, and then I did a lot, then, I, then I, I started doing work in the East Coast and found a whole nother group of people. <laughs> <laughs> but it turned, it, part of it was just me getting used to the people and they have a different man mannerisms in, 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 on the East Coast than they did in the Midwest, you know. They're, the way they, they talked to one another and act was, I thought was, was just outrageous and rude, but it was just the way they interacted with one another nobody seemed to think about. It. So it took me a little bit to get used to that, but I think working in, in the Midwest just was, in general, was better. Smaller shops, and, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, VM people and, and BSE people have always been very receptive and welcoming and easygoing. So... Thank you. All right, so um, one last one. Um, is there any bit of advice, if somebody was starting their career today, any bit of advice you would give them or any advice you would have given yourself if you could go back in time um, that, that you'd want to share? Anybody? I'll start. <laughs> it's just a job. Um, yesterday was my 37th wedding anniversary. Yay. And uh, when I was in, hadn't been I, when I when I got into being an SE, uh, a couple of years in, I went to this class and it was being taught by, it was in, it was an insurance industry class and it was being taught by these. The way IBM worked at the time was you would be a first line manager and then you go to a staff position and you'd be a second line manager and then you go to staff position and then you might become a branch manager or something like that. So this was a staff level position teaching this class. And, and it was it was held at a hotel and all the, the and so we and they were, they provided meals at the hotel so we all sat and ate together in the evening kind of like we get together here and so we're sitting around with these people that are in you know preparing to be second and third line managers and so forth and almost to a person 
all of them were divorced, remarried, some of them divorced, <laughs> remarried a couple different times. And it made me realize that I needed to make sure I focused more on my family than I did on my career because in the long run, that was where the real value was going to be. So, you know, there, there's a lot to be said for the careers that we have, but there's a lot to be said to, for, for our families and so forth. So, you know, we raised three girls and, and, and have had a wonderful life together. And now we're enjoying the, 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 the mountains of Denver. So, hey, don't waste 20 years in the oil and gas business. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, 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 really quite seriously. Uh, you know, back when I was planning my college education and seeing what was available and things like that, you didn't have a career like the ones we, we were talking about here. You know, you had to get a real job. And, uh, you know, I, I took one, and I do, I do enjoy the geophysical aspect of it, that was fine. But looking back, if I had made the switch in careers much earlier, that would have been much better for me, uh, personally. Because uh, this environment has just been such a good environment. And the oil and gas business, it's up and down. What's the price of oil today? Well, it's sixty-five dollars a barrel. Okay, you're hired. Okay. <laughs> Year from now, what's the price of oil? Thirty-five dollars a barrel. Well, sorry, we got to cut back. You're in. No, I, I had that happen to me four times in twenty years. So, thank you. Well, I would, I, I've been very fortunate to, to have a career doing something I'm very passionate about. I, I like what I do. I, I like it very much. Um, I consider it a hobby. Um, I've been doing this for many years. I'm getting paid to do my hobby. I mean, I'm just very, very fortunate. So I, I would say to young people, just do, follow your passion. Do what you're passionate about. Try to find a job where they'll pay you to do something that, that you love to do. I, I just got lucky. Cool. Nice. All right. Well, uh, I think we're out of time here. We're probably past you. But Thank you all uh, for joining us. If you join me in, in thanking my, my crew up here, my humble gentlemen. Uh, so thank you guys very much for that. Um,